Uh, welcome to the September 2023 edition of the Rima webinar series. Now on to the reason why we're actually all here today. And um, before I introduce our speaker, I just want to add a quick note to set the stage here, because as you know, there are very many different, let's say, flavors of high C. We have genome-wide high C capture, high chip, single cell, and even within like genome-wide high C, which is what we're focusing on today, there are many different research questions that um, you may be interested in addressing using a genome-wide high C approach. For example, if you're looking at genome organization or trying to detect structural variants. And from a bioinformatics perspective, these different research questions you may be asking are going to require different bioinformatics pipelines. And we're just not going to be able to get to all of them in a single one hour webinar. So what we've decided to do is start off with a very typical use case that you may use for genome-wide IC, and that is looking at um, chromatin architecture. All right. So now I would like to introduce the star of our show, Sophia Nomaku, who is a computational biologist in the workflow development team um, here at Arima Genomics. She is involved in data processing and algorithm development for Arima products. Sophia received her PhD from the New York University School of Medicine, where she worked on developing computational approaches to uncover mechanisms of chromatin regulation and alterations in cancer. Sophia, we're very excited to have you here today. Uh, welcome, and the floor is yours. Hello. Uh, thank you so much, Janetta, for organizing this webinar. I'm really excited to be here. I hope you can all see my screen right now. This webinar is going to focus on an introduction to analyzing and interpreting high c data. It's going to be more high level. We're not going to look into code today, but if you're interested in looking at code, let us know and maybe we can make that happen. <laughs> so let's start with the outline of uh, our talk today. We're going to take a look at 3D genomics. I see quite a few of you are new to the world of 3D genomics, so hopefully we can convince you that it's a cool set of assays to work on. We're going to take a look at uh, an introduction for bioinformatics analysis, analysis and also take a look at uh, some available high c tools and pipelines just to get you started with for, with your analysis. So let's start 3D genomics. So what, what is 3D genomics, right? So mo most of the genomics assays are focusing on the features of the linear genome, such as maybe I'm assuming some of you are familiar with chromatin accessibility or histone modifications or RNA-seq data. But the genome is not linearly organized in the cell. It's actually folded in 3D space. So we do think that 3D genomics is super important because it can give you, on top of the sequence information, which is the linear genome, it can also give you information about the actual structure of the genome inside the nucleus. So 3D genomics for us is sitting at the intersection of the three very interesting aspects of uh, chromatin and the DNA. First of all, it's the DNA sequence, right? Uh, you can uh, investigate the DNA sequence through many next generation sequencing approaches, but 3D genomics can help you understand the structure of the genome and specifically identify events that are uh, changing, let's say, in a disease context, and it, it can even help you understand drivers of cancer and identify therapeutically targetable uh, targets. Yes, so uh, on top of the structure, it also gives you information about gene regulation because it can give you insights on how genes are uh, regulated in the nucleus through enhancer and promoter interactions. And there are a lot of applications of 3D genomics uh, it can be used for chromosome assembly. It can be used to understand basic genome organization and function, such as compartments, tads, and loops, which is going to be the focus of this webinar. It can help interpret disease risk variants, because let's say if you want to study non-coding RNAs, for example, you cannot do that through a traditional RNA-seq, but uh, a 3D genome uh, technology can help you understand the effect of these link RNAs potentially in other disease in other uh, genes and potentially give you some info on the disease pathogenesis. Um, 3D genomics uh, methods can also under help you understand gene regulation through the folding of chromatin and enhancer promoter interactions. And you can also detect structural variants and gene fusions, which is another very interesting aspect of the applications of 3D genomics. So yeah, we're very interested in knowing what uh, what you guys are working on. I can see uh, about 33 of you are interested in chromosome assembly. Half of you are interested in understanding genome organization. This is really cool because this is the focus of this webinar. 
um, interpreting disease risk variants, also a quarter of you. And wow, 65% of you are interested in studying mechanisms of gene regulation. So hopefully this webinar will be interesting. And about 36% of you are interested in detecting structural variants. Yeah, I'm really excited we have this uh, mix. Hopefully this webinar will be useful for all of you. So yeah, let's uh, keep going. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, how we see 3D genomics being a part of a multi-omics approach. I think rarely we focus on one uh, omics approach nowadays, right? We are we want to have information about the genomic aspect, like the actual sequence of the genome and variations that happen at the sequence level. With 3D genomics, we can also understand how the chromatin folding is regulating genes. And we can add on top of that the information provided by epigenomics assays, which can help us understand those non-sequence modifications on top of you know, the DNA. Transcriptomics, uh, I'm sure we're all very familiar with transcriptomics and RNA sequencing. It helps you probe gene expression. And then you can tie it with proteomics and metabolomics to actually understand what's happening at the level of the cell. So this is a, um, another way of looking at what you can do with a multi-omics approach and how 3D genomics fits into that. So let's say you have a biological question about uh, how does gene expression of oncogenes change between cancer and normal cells? So with a multi-omics approach, you can do several different things to address this question. Let's say you want to do some transcriptomics analysis, such as RNA-seq data. The question that is being addressed with this methodology is whether there is differential expression or not. So with your RNA-seq analysis, you can understand uh, what is the effect of whatever change is happening into the cancer cell on gene expression. Epigenomics is another layer of information that you can get, and it's, uh, let's say, cheap seq assays, which can help you understand binding of proteins on the, the DNA, or ataxic data, which is uh, a method to identify open or closed chromatin. So with epigenomics, you can answer uh, questions such as, is the chromatin state uh, different in any way, and does that correlate with gene expression? So that is another very interesting aspect that can help you understand better what is going on in the cell. But if you also add 3D genomics, you can uh, understand the cause of the changes of gene expression in a better way. The question that you can address with 3D genomics is what is causing this differential expression? And there are very uh, there are many seminal papers in the field demonstrating that sometimes what happens is that there is a change in the chromatin architecture, either a change in a TAD, a loop, or an enhancer promoter interaction that is leading to aberrant gene expression. So I have an example here from a, a recent paper from the IFANTIS lab at NYU. Um, so they, uh, the scientists here studied T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and they wanted to use 3D genomics to understand the mechanisms behind the disease. So here we have a normal T-cell. This is a, a high-C heat map showing you the structure of the genome around the very uh, infamous, I would say, oncogen MYC. So you can see that MYC is located in this part of the chromatin, and there is a very strong super enhancer element that is located a little bit further down. We're going to talk about these structures. These are called TADs, but we're going to talk about that later. Don't worry. So what I want you to pay attention here to is this area between these two structures. They don't seem to be a lot of interactions, right? The signal is very faint. So what that means is that this enhancer element is not activated now, and it's not acting on MYC in any way. But when you probe leukemic cell lines with high C, you can see a change in the architecture. What you can see is that this area that previously didn't have a lot of interactions all of a sudden is enriched. And what that means is that this enhancer now is activated and it's actually acting on MYC. And um, the scientists went deeply into the mechanism. They interrogated, uh, let's say, what is it, what's happening exactly in this area. They found that there is a boundary that is disrupted in this region between these two structures that we talked about, and that boundary is causing the increase of interactions between MYC and the enhancer, the super enhancer, and it's actually believed to be the driver of MYC overexpression. So in this context, using 3D genomics helped uh, inform how MYC is regulated in a healthy cell, like the healthy T cell that we see here on the left. But it also helped understand 
how misorganization of chromatin is affecting mic expression in leukemic cells. So 3D genome organization, what is it? I talked about TADS already. I talked about heat maps, uh, but I want to give you an overview of the hierarchy of genome organization. We all know that genome is not randomly positioned in the nucleus. Uh, if that were the case, we probably wouldn't exist. So if you look at a, a nucleus at the higher level, you're going to see uh, what is called the chromosomal territory. That is basically saying that chromosomes don't really intermingle with each other in the nucleus. They prefer to stay in their own little area. And usually interactions between chromosomes are not that often. Now, if we zoom further into a chromosome, we're going to see that it's roughly partitioned into two areas, the A and the B compartments. So A compartment basically describes the areas of chromatin that are more active transcriptionally. Usually the, the areas of A compartment are enriched for active uh, markers like acetylation. In contrast with the B compartment, which is usually enriched for repressive markers and genes that are located here uh, are not really expressed. Um, we don't stop here though. We can zoom further inside the compartments and we're going to identify chromatin domains. These are called topologically associating domains. And the main function of a topologically associating domain is to basically isolate genes from other enhancer elements around uh, the gene that shouldn't be acting on it. This is the level of a chromatin organization we talked about in the leukemia case. We're not stopping there though. If we further zoom into TAS, we're going to get into uh, regulatory interactions, which are called loops. So loops are folding of the chromatin, bringing together promoter and enhancer elements. And some of you might be familiar with structural proteins that are known to mediate uh, looping. And maybe you've heard of the loop extrusion model. The structural proteins are CDCF, cohesin, and many others. And their role is to basically establish the loop, keep the promoter and enhancer elements together, and make sure that we don't have gene dysregulation. So, uh, we are detecting chromatin conformation with methods such as HI-C. Janetta mentioned that in this webinar, we're going to be focusing on genome-wide HI-C. And this is a way of looking at the data. I don't wanna scare you off. This is a HI-C heat map. We're going to go deeply into how uh, this heat map is created and what it means. But I wanna show you here just a little teaser of what we're working on with here. So let's say we have these four loci located in different areas of the genome at different distances between each other. These loci are uh, far apart on the linear genome. And uh, there's no way to know if we just run uh, a linear, let's say, omics approach, there's no way to know if there are any interactions between them. But with high c we can start observing these enriched areas of signal. We're going to take a look at them later. And it's very helpful to understand how these regions are potentially interacting in the 3D space. So what we can conclude here is that this purple and green region are close to each other, and this uh, gray and blue region are also close to each other. And this way we can get a better idea of how the looping of chromatin is taking place. But I don't want to scare you. We're going to take a look right now into how to generate this heat map. So let's jump straight to the introduction to bioinformatics for high c data part of this webinar. So uh, I just want to give you an idea of where we are in the whole experimental workflow. Uh, we are assuming here that you have chosen your samples, you've done your sample prep, you have generated your library, and also you've done your sequencing. And now you have your FASTQ files out of the sequencer, and you don't really know what to do with them. So we're going to focus on this part, the part of data analysis, so that you can get your heat map. So for the purposes of this webinar, we split the different steps of bioinformatics analysis like this. We are going to talk about aligning and pairing, filtering, binning, normalization. And we're also going to talk about visualizing the high C heat map and what can you do in terms of downstream analysis if you want to identify loops, TADs, and compartments. So I know that not all available bioinformatics pipelines out there are following these exact steps, but for the purposes of this webinar, we thought this is a good idea. This is a good starting point for you to understand uh, more or less what is going on exactly when you have your FASTQ files and you give them to your bioinformatician 
or you know what you need to do if you want to analyze the data yourself. So in order to keep some continuity and be consistent, we're going to be following a, a publicly available pipeline, Juicer. This is also a pipeline that we recommend to use for your high C data analysis. And there are many reasons why. We think it's a very flexible pipeline. It can get you from raw fastq files to the .hi-c file, for which we're going to talk about, and this is your heat map. And it also actually has incorporated a lot of uh, tools in order to identify structural features of the genome, such as loops. It can even do differential loop analysis, in case you're interested. You can identify tabs and compartments. And it also comes with its own little visualization tool. We're going to take a look at this one, which is called Juicebox. And when we were running our internal benchmarkings to try to decide which pipeline we want to use, we concluded that Juicer showed a high concordance of loops between biological and technical replicates. So we thought that was a good benchmark to choose this pipeline. So for this presentation, I'm going to follow and describe these steps to you based on Juicer. Some other pipelines might be doing things a little bit differently, but I think and this is still a really good introduction for you to know what each step is doing more or less and what type of information you can get from each one of these steps. So without further ado, let's jump into aligning and pairing. This is the first step of every pipeline. And we've done our sample prep, our library prep, we have done our sequencing, and we have our FASTQ files. And you have a, a forward read and a reverse read. Hi c is a paired and read uh, technology. So these two reads will uh, be paired with each other using a unique read name. But when you get your FASTQ files, you get them separate. So you need to align first uh, one of the reads, the forward read, then align the reverse read, and then you need to use that unique read name identifier to pair them together. So after aligning your reads, not all of them will be useful. That's why you need to do a filtering step. So what exactly happen is, happens in filtering? So from all of these reads, there might be some cases where we need to remove uh, low quality alignments. And this is uh, the case where you didn't achieve alignment mapping or mapping quality of more than 30 for both the reads, for both the read ends. Uh, these are, there are cases we don't want to keep. We're not sure where these reads are aligning. So we don't want to keep wrong full information in our assay. So this needs to be removed. Uh, PCR and optical duplicates also need to be removed. We want to have uh, one unique read. If we notice a lot of reads piling up in the exact same region and they're the exact same reads, we want to remove them and keep only one of them. And we also want to remove what is called abnormal alignments. So these definitions of abnormal alignments that we're going to talk about are more specific to Juicer, uh, but other pipelines also have some subcategories of them, which could also be interesting. But in the context of Juicer, what is a normal alignment? Let's look at that first. Normal alignments are cases where both reads map to a unique location on the genome. And this is exactly what we want. We want to be able to know where the two reads came from and which two areas of the genome they're bringing together. Another case of a normal read is a chimeric read. So chimeric reads, if you can uh, look in this little a schematic right here is the cases where one of the reads is actually crossing the restriction cut site. So what that means is that part of this read now is aligning in one location of the genome, and the other part of the read is aligning in a further location uh, away uh, in the genome. So these reads are actually super useful because they corroborate uh, the information that these two genomic locations are actually interacting with each other. So these are chimeric reads, which means one of the reads is split into two different genomic locations. However, the alignment of these reads is unambiguous and there is no, um, let's say, doubt as to whether they're aligning on the genome. So these reads are very useful reads and we definitely want to keep them for our high C analysis. Now, what are the abnormal alignments? In any case, you have a mappability issue, you need to remove that read. So let's say we have these chimeric reads, 
But in this case, one of the reads ends up being a little bit too short and it doesn't align properly on the genome, then this read pair needs to be discarded. Similarly, similarly, if any of the two ends don't align uniquely on the genome, we need to remove them whether the read is chimeric or not. So after filtering our reads, uh, Juicer, as well as other pipelines such as HiCup, they all output a summary report to give you a better idea of how, of the quality of your sample and also the quality of your experiment. So let's walk through some of these, uh, the highlights of this report that we think are very important for you to keep in mind. First of all, we have the two categories, the normal pairs and the chimeric pairs. These are the ones we talked about two slides ago, and these are super important for the analysis. They're valid high C pairs and they will, they will be maintained. On the contrary, the ambiguous chimeric pairs and the ones that did not map uniquely on the genome will be removed during filtering. And I also want to talk about here a little bit about some specifications that we have determined at ARIMA as to what constitutes a good quality sample and a successful experiment. So if you want to have a successful experiment, you would like to aim for less than 20% uh, chimeric ambiguous reads and less than 6% unmapped reads. Uh, also, we have this uh, number here that is being outputted by Juicer. It's the alignable reads. This is the uh, sum of normal and chimeric pairs. And for a really good ARIMA uh, sample and library um, uh, prep, we want this to be more than 80%. Another uh, interesting thing to notice in this report is the duplicates. The PCR and the optical duplicates, we don't want this to be very high. And these are removed during filtering. Another very interesting uh, thing I want to draw your attention to here is the interchromosomal reads. So some pipelines remove them from the analysis. Juicer is actually maintaining them. And for a good sample and a, and a successful experiment, we want them to be around 20%, not, not more than 20%. And uh, the idea here is that if uh, your interchromosomal reads are very high, that uh, probably leads to a slightly noisier sample, and you don't want that. However, keep in mind that you can use these interchromosomal reads if you want to, let's say, do structural variant analysis. This could be really useful if you're interested in that. And uh, the last metric that we want to pay attention to is the long-range uh, interactions. So hi c is a method that interrogates chromatin folding and interactions. And we're very interested in two interactions between genomic loci that are far away from the genome. So making sure that your experiment has enough long range interactions, more than 40% in this case, is super important for a successful, let's say, loop calling later on. I just quickly want to touch on these two numbers that you see here in this report. Uh, I want to uh, prevent any confusion. These are basically percentages of long range reads in this case. It's just that the denominator changes. This is the percentage calculated uh, out of all sequenced read pairs, which is this top value up here. And this is the percentage out of the unique read pairs, which is this value here after you've removed the duplication. So what we care about is that this percentage, the, the one out of all the unique read pairs is more than 40%. So in this slide, I really want to make a comment about, um, let's say, a, a best practice for you to do your experiment. So imagine you have this very precious, precious patient, sam patient sample that you really want to do high C on, and you really go like you know full on. You sequence very deeply. You spend a lot of money, and then you come here at the summary report, and you realize that your sample is not hitting these metrics. That could be disastrous, right? Because you have no more material left to repeat the experiment. So what we're suggesting is that you start small. You sequence shallow, like one or two million reads, and you run uh, an analysis like this. And if your library is hitting um, these specifications, then it's probably safe and OK for you to take your sample and actually go full throttle into a deeper sequencing. This is a a consideration we would like you to make, especially if your samples are very precious to you.
Okay, so after aligning and filtering out the reads that are not useful for the high C experiment, it's time to start moving closer to uh, the high C contact matrix. And that happens during the step of the pipeline that's called binning. So what is the high C contact matrix? Uh, instead of having a list of interactions, uh, the field has decided that it's easier for humans to understand a 2D uh, structure. So high C data is oftentimes plotted um, in a matrix format, one for each chromosome. And in order to produce this matrix format, you need to bin the genome in windows of specific length. And here we have an example where we've binned chromosome one into one kilobase bins. And I want to draw your attention to this area between one and two kilobases, and then also this area between six and seven. And the value that you're going to see in the high C contact matrix, the raw high C contact matrix, is actually the number of reads between these two regions. So if we go back to the 1D representation that we've been working on so far, you, you have one location here on the genome, one to two kilobases, and then six to seven on chromosome one. And you're going to see that you had exactly 10 reads aligning between these two uh, regions. And this is the number that will be represented in your high C contact matrix. And this is also called the interaction frequency between these two bins or these two loci. So binning is uh, an important step. Uh, the bin you choose can actually determine the resolution of your analysis. So what we mean by that is the smaller your bin, the higher your resolution. So uh, let's say if you have a one kilobase bin size, that means your the resolution of your analysis is also 1 KB. And what this allows you to do, the resolution and the bin size, allows you to identify interactions between genomic loci that are, in this case, one kilobase away. So how do you choose your bin size? That is a very uh, common question in the field, and it's um, it's interesting. It's context dependent, as most of things in this life. So, dependent on the analysis and the resolution you want to achieve, you can use different bin sizes. Let's say you have you want to do compartment calling. Uh, so, compartment calling usually uh, the suggested bin size to do this analysis is at a hundred KB resolution. This is widely used in the field and is considered to be a good resolution for you to be able to identify chromatin compartments. If you're interested in uh, doing TAD calling, an average uh, bin size you can start with is 50 KB. And if you're interested in loop calling, we suggest that you start from 5 KB bins. So it is known that the sequencing depth of your experiment can affect how high your resolution can be. So uh, if your sample is of good quality and your library is complex enough, which means that you have a lot of unique reads, you don't have too many duplicates, um, you're, it's probably it's possible that you can go at a higher resolution for your analysis. And we have some recommendations here specifically for mammalian genomes. Uh, if you want to do an analysis, let's say at 5 KB loop calling, we suggest that you uh, sequence at 600 million paired end reads at least. We, we, uh, through our tests, we have identified that this number is sufficient for most experiments to be able to do loop calling at 5 KB. And now if you want to go all the way uh, down to 1 KB loop calling, 1 KB resolution, we recommend that you sequence to at least 1 billion paired end reads. These are just some recommendations uh, about the bean size that you can use for your analysis. And um, here we have our first quiz question. Um, let's say you wanna, you would like to call loops at 5 KB resolution in your sample from mammalian cell lines. How should you proceed after you've completed your library prep? Answer A, sequence to about 2 million paired end reads, then evaluate your library complexity and other QC metrics. Option B, sequence to 600 million paired end reads, then evaluate your library complexity and the QC metrics at that point. Or option C, sequence to 1 billion paired and reads. And in this case, there's no need for you to evaluate the library complexity or other QC metrics because the sequencing depth is sufficiently high. So I'm really excited to see your answers here. Mm. Let's see. Okay. 
So I see that about 43% uh, of you chose uh, answer A, which is actually the correct one. So um, about half of you chose answer B, 600 million paired and reads, and uh, about 11% of you chose uh, option C. So uh, we understand how this can be confusing because I just told you that our recommendation is to sequence at 600 million paired in reads if you want to achieve 5KB resolution, right? Yes, that's what I told you. But it's also important to keep in mind that sometimes if your sample quality is low, that means that your the library that you end up with is not complex enough. That means that there aren't enough unique um, fragments to be amplified. And what ends up happening is you get a lot of PCR duplicates. So it there are high chances that out of the 600, 600 million paired and reads, a lot of them will be duplicates and you might not be able to achieve the resolution that you want because you don't have enough data. So what do you, we suggest that you do um, is actually do a little trial experiment first. We usually call this a shallow sequencing. So you sequence your library uh, at a shallower depth so that you don't, uh, you know, I guess a waste of too much money in case your sample is not very good. Then you make sure your sample is complex enough so you don't have too many duplicates and you're meeting all the QC metrics. And after that, you go full throttle sequence at 600 million reads. We just want to make sure that you don't spend money in case your sample is not very good. And that can happen if the sample is old or in case something went wrong in the library prep and the experimental process. That's why we recommend that you start shallow first and then deeply sequence. So this last uh, point is also valid, right? You're assuming that if I sequence very deeply, everything will be okay, but that's not always the case. We need to make sure that you have enough unique fragments in your library to uh, amplify them and not get too many duplicates. Okay, so after we've binned our and uh, we've have created our high C contact matrix, it's time to go on to normalization. Normalization is a very big uh, field. It's a, a very, I guess, complex subject, but we can talk about what it's trying to achieve. There are so many normalization techniques out there, and all of them are trying to correct for some biases in the high C uh, experimental process. And known bias is the GC content. Uh, regions and reads with high GC content seem to be preferentially amplified during PCR and sequencing. So that means that your fragments that are GC rich will probably be overrepresented in your library. On the contrary, there are a lot of cases on the genome that are repetitive, such as the centromeres that I'm showing here and the telomeres. And uh, aligners usually have a really hard time aligning reads there because they cannot uniquely identify where the read is aligning. So areas with repetitive uh, regions, uh, repetitive regions are usually underrepresented in high C data. And another bias of the high C uh, technique is uh, sometimes the fragment length, um, I mean, fragment uh, fragments with different types of lengths are not equally represented. So after you've um, uh, cut your DNA with the restriction enzyme and you're ready to do your ligation, uh, you're going to have some short fragments, some intermediate length fragments, and some very long fragments. And that's something you can't really control because it's dependent on your enzyme chemistry. So what happens if we look here at this heat map after um, analyzing the, the fragment length and the frequency of these fragments, we can see that fragments with uh, an intermediate length are usually more represented in the high C library. So in terms of normalizations, there are so many methods out there. Uh, some of them are uh, quite different from others, trying to use different statistical models, but we think this, for the purposes of this workshop, we, we felt that it might be more confusing than uh, enlightening to talk about all the normalization methods. So one normalization method that is widely used in the field and is also implemented in JUICER is the Knight-Ruiz KR normalization. The reason why we're suggesting that you start here is because it's a fast implementation and it has been shown to have high concordance of TAD calls between biological replicates. And this is what I'm showing here. Uh, this is from a review paper. 
that I'm citing. And uh, what we can see is that we have a normal cell line, this lymphoblastoid cells. These are TADs on one chromosome. And if we focus on the KR normalization here, we can see that it has high concordance of uh, TAD calls. The Jacquard index here is just a concordance metric. So it's one of the methods with a pretty high concordance between TADs. It's very uh, similar to ICE. This is the classic iterative correction method, in case you've heard about it. So methods uh, in this family, uh, we would say, are uh, one of the good ones to start with. One note I would like to make here is if uh, you're suspecting that your chromatin structures are less frequent in the population, like it's something that you feel it's quite rare, it's like a subclone. Uh, in case you're trying to find uh, events that are less frequent, I would just suggest that you avoid normalization methods that smooth the data too much. Okay, so now we have obtained our normalized contact matrix. Let's go into the visualization, which is uh, the way for us to actually understand our data. So the high C heat map, which is what we are all used to seeing, is basically nothing other than the contact matrix that we saw before, colored based on the frequency of interactions. So areas with more color on the heat map represent areas with more reads, therefore more likelihood of contacts. So after you have your normalized contact matrix, you can choose to view at the heat map in this 2D uh, square view. Uh, I just want to mention here that high C contact matrices and heat maps are always symmetrical. That's why we don't have data here at the bottom corner because it's the exact mirror of the data here on the top. So you can choose to see your data like this as a two by two matrix or take a look at the, basically half the matrix, flip it, and you have this nice little triangle structures that some of you might have seen before. So let's go back and take a look at the two loci that we were looking at earlier, the 1 to 2 kb region and the 6 to 7 kb regions. And, you know, we can see that here, here they are. We can see their interactions. They're colored by uh, intensity. And this is basically the high C heat map. This is what you are visualizing when you want to look at your data. So the high C heat map is a very useful tool. Here I have we have a heat map of the complete human genome. You can see all your chromosomes nicely sorted by size in this case, and you can observe that um, interactions within chromosomes are higher and more common, which means we have a stronger signal here, in, uh, compared to interactions between chromosomes, which is this salmon color area out here. They're not uh, completely infrequent, but in normal cells, you wouldn't expect to see too many of them. So, um, yes. Uh, now, we usually don't just take a look at a heat map and, you know, move around the heat map just to have fun. I mean, you can do that. No judgment. Sometimes I do it. But usually we want to have something to overlay on the heat map, an additional level of information about the chromatin structures that we're looking for. So to do that, we're going to move on to the downstream analysis that you can apply on uh, high C data. And we're going to take a look at loops, tads, and compartments. There are a lot of tools available for looped calling, tad calling. And actually, for compartments, I, I realize that there's only one. It's the uh, principal component analysis and the eigenvector. So that makes our life easier. Like, do I want to call compartments? OK, I'm going to use the eigenvector approach. But for loops and tads, there are a lot of tools. And that just goes to show you that this field is, is evolving. Everybody wants to improve the loop calling. Everybody wants to improve TADs. And if you take a look at the papers I've cited down here, they are all reviews from this year or last year. So this field is actively trying to figure out what is the best method to do loop calling and TAD calling. I've highlighted a few of these methods here. Some of them are better, let's say, if we focus on TADs. Some of these are better at calling TADs at higher uh, resolutions, which means that they can give us more information about the sub tad structure. Um, so we suggest that you start here with uh, the pre-installed, the pre-implemented uh, methods in Juicer. So for TADS, it's uh, the other, an algorithm called Arrowhead. Arrowhead. Arrowhead is pretty good at identifying the sub tads, tads at higher resolutions. And Hiccups is also a very well-established loop calling uh, method that we have um, 
benchmarked and it gives really good reproducibility between replicates. So um, yeah, we suggest that you start here. If you really love a specific tag color or a specific loop color, you know, we're not here to tell you don't use it. I just want to mention that the field is evolving. And even if you compare results between, let's say, three tag colors, you're going to find very different calls. And that is something that has always bugged me, but it's the truth, right? Um, so what I would suggest is if you want to have a consensus TAD list, maybe you can try running several different TAD callers and then keep the common calls because we have really high confidence that these are probably real if like three or four different methods called them. But definitely these methods are just suggestions as a starting point for you. And now let's go back to the heat map and overlay these structures on top of the heat map to try and you know see what type of information we can get. So I have some uh, pictures here, but I think it's best if we go and do this interactively. So let's jump into this environment. This is Juicebox, the visualization tool that comes with the Juicer suite of tools. And I want to show you here how HiC data looks like. So here I have uh, a normal cell line, G GM12878 cells, they're lymphoblasts. And we have the high C heat map with all the beautiful contact frequencies. And I wanna show you this track up here. This is how compartments are visualized in a tool like this. So if we zoom into this heat map, we can see that uh, some areas have positive values for compartments and some areas have negative values, right? And these correspond to the areas of the heat map. So we can see that this region all the way down here, which is where the pink signal ends, this is part of one of the compartments. And here we see that the signal switches to negative values. This means that this region to all the way up to here, oops, uh, is at the other compartment. It's a pretty cool way to take a look at your data and try to figure out if, let's say I had a favorite gene in this area, like which compartment is it in? So you probably noticed that I didn't say that positive values are compartment A and negative values are compartment B. This it is usually the case, but I would suggest that if you wanted to figure out which compartment is which, it's best if you go back and overlay, uh, let's say, acetylation markers to try to see if this region of chromatin is actually active or not. So let's move away from compartments and let's load some tads here to try and see a uh, how the tabs look like on a heat map. So for this particular sample, we have run the analysis at multiple resolutions. I know we said that you can start at 50 KB. Here I have results from 10 KB to 250. So this blue one is like a 250 KB big like tad. It's probably not a tad. It probably encompasses a lot of other ones. So let's zoom and interrogate this structure right here. Let's take a look. Uh, I think I like this one quite a bit. So based on the different resolution, you will end up calling uh, uh, some bigger areas or not. And then what's really cool is that you can zoom in and try to identify sub tad regions. So um, this is here in yellow is a nice tad. This is a different tad in the structure and you can uh, look at your favorite gene and where it's landing. And also we can look at loop calling. So loop calling is um, it here represented with these dark colors. Loops are these little dots on the heat map. Sorry, I think I zoomed in too much. These little dots on the heat map that are probably meaning that the two interacting domains are in close special proximity. And if one of them is an enhancer and a promoter, you could have a regulatory interaction taking place here. So this is just a, a general way of how you can view your data. You can see there's a lot of loops called, a lot of tads and sub tads. And I think it's really cool to try and identify uh, if you can extract information about the chromatin structure and you know the regulation of the gene that you're interested in. So let's move on. I have some uh, still representations. And at this point, we have the second quiz question. Uh, we want you to know if you can tell us what is this structure, what are the structures that I have circled here with um, on the heat map? Is it compartments? Is it tads? Is it loops? Or is there no way for us to know? 
So I just want to, you know, leave a hint here. This is, this calls, these calls have been made at 5KB resolution. So maybe you remember what type of resolutions we suggested for each one of these analyses. Uh, hopefully this is not a trick question. Hopefully it's just to keep you on your toes. And yes, I see 87% of you say that this is a loop. And I think I agree with you. It, it, it could also demarcate a tad. It's not completely wrong, but this particular area, when you see like a very strong peak, it's usually, uh, we believe that it's a loop, which could be part of a tad, which is part of a compartment. So yes. Okay, let's move on. Okay, we've covered all the different aspects of bioinformatics analysis steps that uh, we have uh, uh, you know, included in this uh, presentation. Before we move on to actual uh, pipelines, I really want to just give you a little teaser of what type of file you're getting out of each step. So some of you might have heard, I mean, I'm sure all of you have heard of FASTQ files. This is what comes out of the sequencer, and then you put it into your pipeline. But what is a SAM or a BAM file? These are the files that you get after alignment and also after filtering. So now you know that, okay, if I have a, a BAM file, this is probably what came out of the aligner and the filtering step. Now for Juicer, after binning and normalization, you get a file called .hi-c. This is the contact matrix that we looked at. And uh, in the context of Juicer, this is the file that is being uh, used as an input for any downstream analysis. You just use the .hi-c file, you pass it through the algorithms and you get loops, tads, and compartments. So uh, a BetBE file, in case you're not familiar with it, is just a, a file demonstrating interactions. So one end of the file is one end of the uh, interacting loci, and the other part of the file will be the other end. And compartments are usually in a peak format. Uh, this is an example of a, a format that you might find a compartment call. It's called a weak file. And to visualize your data, you use the .hi-c file. In this case, you can put it through Juicebox and look at your heat map. So the last section of the webinar, we are uh, nearing our time, is just a quick overview of other tools and pipelines. We talked about all these steps. I just want to bring to your attention that not all pipelines will do all these steps. So based on what it is that you want to do specifically with your analysis, you might want to consider which pipeline to use. So for example, HICAP, which is a very well-known established pipeline for analysis of high C data will actually do only the first two steps for you. And then you need to take the BAM file and you know work your magic and uh, go down the, the path of analysis. Some other well-known pipelines like HiC Pro will do will take the FASTQ files and take you to your normalized contact matrix. And some of them offer some visualization options as well. And there are pipelines that encompass this entire analysis under one umbrella. Uh, one of them is Juicer, and HiC Explorer is also widely used. So, and this is one of the reasons why we decided to go with Juicer to start with as a, as a starting pipeline for you. So a little bit more about Juicer in case you want to try it in terms of the computational resources. So uh, Juicer is optimized for analysis on a computational server or the cloud. So it's highly possible that you will not be able to run this on your computer, especially if you have a lot of reads. And we recommend that for 600 million paired and reads, use 100 gigabytes of memory and 24 CPUs. Uh, just to give you a sense of time, like uh, high C data analysis can take up quite some time. For 600 million paired and reads, we've observed that the pipeline finishes in about three days. And if you uh, have data up to a billion paired and reads, it could take a week. And it's the alignment step that takes most of the time. Juicebox is the, the, the tool that I showed you briefly in the little teaser. It uh, is part of Juicer, but even if you uh, generate your .hi-c files in a different way, you can still load them with Juicebox and take a look at them. You can use this one locally on your computer, like I just showed you, and you can visualize many cool features, compartments, tabs, loops, and take a look at your data. So based on our interactions with our customers, um, we uh, suggest that we use Juicer. It's the pipeline that we support mostly. And what I mean by that is that we can help you in case you have issues installing the pipeline. We're also able to support HiCup, and this is a pipeline that our customers also use. And some of our customers use HiC Explorer. 
we might be able to offer some assistance. We're not experts on High Sea Explorer, but in case you have questions, maybe we're able to help you. And just to wrap up, I would like to talk about the ARIMA containerized pipelines. So we do recognize that bioinformatics analysis can be quite daunting for high C. I hope this this workshop made it, this webinar made it a little easier for you. If you are thinking of starting to analyze the data yourself, I hope you feel a little bit more confident doing it. But sometimes there can be some challenges, especially if you need to install a lot of packages and tools yourself. So what we have decided to do here at ARIMA is to make it a little easier and package some publicly available and well-documented tools in a pipeline, along with all the dependencies, all the packages that they need. And this is what we mean by containers. We have Docker and Singularity containers, two different um, modalities that you can use. And we have also put a lot of effort into making the error files and the QC more informative. Some of these pipelines might be missing a few QC metrics that we believe are important for you to understand how your experiment went or how your analysis is going. And we have them all on GitHub. So just a little teaser, we have a mapping pipeline. If you wanna take your high C paradigm reads and map them to your uh, genome of uh, preference and then do the analysis that you want. We also have a pipeline for structural variant detection. I know we didn't talk about this, but um, we do have one. Um, and yes, in case you want to identify structural variants from your high C data, you can try taking a look at our SV detection pipeline. And finally, we didn't talk about capture high C data today, but we do have a capture high C pipeline, and it uses um, an established algorithm for loop calling in terms of capture high C data. So with that, I really want to thank you for being here today. I hope this webinar was informative for you and inspiring to start your own analysis. I uh, encourage you to take a look at Bioinformatics, our Bioinformatics user guides and our documentation on the ARIMA website. And with that, I want to hand it off to Janetta for the quiz uh, part of the webinar. And yeah, thank you so much for being here. I hope this was informative. Awesome. Sophia, thank you so much. I love listening to all your presentations, even outside of the webinar. You're just such a, a phenomenal speaker and just want to give a shout out to Sophia for agreeing to be here with us today, because as I'm sure all of us on this call are painfully aware, bioinformaticians are always super busy and our bioinfo team is no exception. Um, so thank you so much, um, Sophia, for your time. Since you guys are here on the webinar, I have some super exciting news to share. And um, since you're here, you're going to kind of hear it first. Um, and that news is that we're launching a bioinformatics platform very soon. So for now, the only pipeline that's going to be available on this platform is a pipeline for structural variant detection. And you can kind of see on my screen the different visualizations um, that are going to be available. And for now, that's all I'm going to share. If you want, scan the QR code um, to uh, sign up and be the first to know when we launch the bioinformatics platform. Um, but really, it's going to be a very user-friendly online platform for genomic data analysis. And we're really excited um, to um, share it with you very soon. So uh, first question, six upvotes. Uh, are there any recommendations of statistical tests for comparing the results of different samples? For example, testing for statistically significant differences between samples or for assessment of the robustness or reproducibility of replicates? Thank you for the webinar. Yeah, this is a very good question. Comparing results uh, between high C conditions or uh, let's say disease conditions is super important. I think uh, there are a lot of tools like the, the juicer hiccups diff functionality that are able to do differential loop calling, for example. Um, I don't remember right now what type of statistical tests they're using, but a lot of them are trying to follow um, an RNA-seq kind of style of uh, enrichment. Yes, maybe I need to take a look at that. And maybe, Allison, in case you want to jump in, please feel free. But I do think that there are quite a few tools out there in case you're interested in doing differential analysis. I would have to take a look at it, though. All right. Um, next question. And uh, panelists, if you want to filter by most outvoted, you're, you'll be able to kind of see well, what question I'm going to be asking next. And how many samples are needed to see differences in tabs and compartments? And how would you combine samples or do statistics? A little similar to the previous one. Right. Um, so for tads and compartments, I think generally we do suggest that you have at least two replicates for your analysis so that you can see uh, if the results are robust across replicates. 
Now for, um, in order to combine the samples, uh, we do suggest that you do that after the alignment. Like if you align your reads and you have the filter reads, then you can merge those two bond files and continue with your analysis. In case, let's say you have two samples and you want to put the reads together. But generally, at least two replicates, I think, are good. All right. Um, next question with seven upvotes. Can you comment on comparing a patient versus a normal sample by dividing or subtracting signals? Mm -hmm. So yes, that is a, that's a very good question. Uh, sometimes in the field, what we do, it would be, we would subtract one high C heat map from the other, right? And try to see the differences in the chromatin structure. Uh, that's, I think, a common practice, but if we do want to implement statistics, I think there is a tool that does comparison of heat maps. Um, I think it's high C diff. Yes, I need to take a look at this exact mm -hmm. yep. one, you know, yeah. Great. We're kind of uh, moving fast here. Uh, I'm seeing 30 questions, so we're definitely not going to get through all of them, but uh, keep upvoting the ones that um, that you like and keep looking um, to see if there's any on the bottom that we uh, should answer. All right, here's a question from Caroline. Do you have any recommendations for increasing the percentage of long range read pairs if you're not achieving that 40% target? Mm -hmm. I don't know if we want to field this question to Allison. Sure. Maybe. Yeah, so, I mean, so you can always, there's some tricks that you can use to optimize your uh, efficiency of high C um, to sort of increase that percentage of long range cyst. You, you want to optimize your digestion by tenfillin and ligation efficiency. Um, in, in some parts, it depends a bit on your, your sample type. So you can always contact tech support to get some advice for your specific experiments. But there's some steps in high C that you can adjust, um, such as you can extend the digestion. I mean, our typically, like the what we have in our protocol, the 30 to 60 minutes um, works fantastic. But certainly that can be extended longer to two hours and even overnight. Um, you can also adjust the conditioning solution step from... Um, 10 minutes and increase that to 20 minutes. Um, it says sometimes uh, cause an increase in interchromosomal reactions, but there's certainly some steps in the protocol that we can adjust um, to get you closer to that 40%. I mean, and then there's, there's some sample types such as like plants that do tend to have like a, a lower percent long range cyst. So um, another option too, is that you can actually um, combine two data from two samples together. Yeah, there's uh, definitely a lot of things that you can do. And I think that just goes to um, say how important it is to make sure that you're following QC steps and you're doing shallow sequencing so you don't have, end up in a situation where um, you're missing your QC targets and you've, you've spent all this money on sequencing. All right. Um, what about recommendations for sequencing length? For example, 150 pair dens. Yeah, I was going to say typically we recommend 150 base pair uh, pair den reads. Um, I mean, one thing, and Sophia, you can comment on this too, is that if your reads are too short, it might actually bump up the percentage of chimeric ambiguous because make make it harder to not be uniquely. Um, 100 percent, exactly what Allison said. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we have time, I think, for maybe like one last question. Um, is there any particular, I like to throw this to the panelists, is there any particular question that you see here um, that you would like to answer? So I see an interesting, I mean, all of them are super cool. <laughs> um, I think there's one question about removing duplicates and whether that changes the biological interactions frequency. I know maybe you're interested in copy number variants and you're worried that if you remove duplicates, you're removing your biological effect. So I want to say that it shouldn't. It should just remove duplicates that come from PCR or the sequencing artifacts. If you want to see, uh, let's say, an enrichment of signal because of a copy number variant, that will not affect your analysis. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, Thank all of them you. are really cool. I think we should probably. I think I think Sophia, this means that we need to do another bioinformatics webinar. <laughs> Alrighty. <laughs> Um, well, we are five minutes past the hour. I know everybody's uh, really busy. And thank you so much to everyone who has stayed here all the way through to the end. Thank you so much to our wonderful speaker, Sophia, as well as to Allison for jumping into the Q&A. And thank you all for attending this webinar. And we will see you next month um, at our next Arima webinar. So stay tuned for that.